Welcome to Why Public Service, a podcast of the R Street Institute, a free market think tank in Washington, D.C. I'm your host, Kevin Kosar. In each episode, I speak with an individual who made the choice to participate in governing our nation. Some of my guests have worked for the government. Others have toiled in various private sector organizations, including think tanks, philanthropies, and political groups. All of them share the same goal, however, which is to improve our country through public service. Today's guest is Cynthia Ritchie Terrell, the founder and executive director of Represent Women, an organization that advocates for reforms to advance women's representation and leadership in the United States. Cynthia has been in public service for much of her life. She helped found FairVote, a group that is helping update America's election laws. And she has worked for presidential, congressional, state, and local campaigns. You can learn more about Cynthia Ritchie Terrell by visiting representwomen.org. Cynthia, welcome to the Why Public Service podcast. Thank you. As our listeners have heard, you've held many different positions in public service. For today's episode, I want to speak to you both about your leadership of Represent Women and your career in governance reform generally. So my first question for you is, why did you found Represent Women? Well, that's a great question. Thanks so much for having me on your podcast. Um, I have always been interested in politics. I I, uh, graduated from college on a Friday, and I got a job working on a U.S. Senate campaign on Monday of the next week. And so there was a very short period of time when I was not employed in politics. And since then, I've worked on a lot of different campaigns at all levels of government. And I've uh, been involved in the founding of a couple other nonprofits, notably FairVote, which is an organization that works on um, voting system reform in the United States. And as the um, centennial of suffrage was approaching about five years ago, I began to think more um, uh, in an intellectually rigorous way about the fact that the United States ranked so far below other countries in women's representation. And while I had always known that there was a connection to voting systems and rules that other countries used, it occurred to me that there was no organization in the United States working on um, studying those rules and best practices and trying to figure out ways to advance those best practices in the United States. So that's why I decided to found Represent Women, really to fill what I saw as a gaping hole in um, the conversation about representation and about uh, rules and systems that advance representation for women. So you founded this organization, but you also serve as the executive director. What are the duties of the executive director? Uh, That's a great question. I was hoping maybe you would tell me, but this is, as far as I know, the duties really, um, I think, require a sense of vision about where you want the organization to go, what the mission is, and then what the strategy is to, to achieve that mission, all the while still maintaining the, the current day-to-day work, but also thinking about what you need to do each month and then by the end of the year, and then um, ideally thinking about how your organization, or in my case, how Represent Women fits into the ecosystem and, and supports and reflects the best work of other people in the community of people that are working on women's representation, how I can add to that. And then also how to build the kinds of partnerships that are necessary to really be successful in the long term. So I think the duties of an executive director really go from um, the nuts and bolts, making sure your system's in order and that your, your uh, books are um, audited and all your forms are filed and so forth, hiring staff, advertising interns and then really delving into the program planning that's required to meet your goals, and then figuring out how to work well in the community of people with whom we share goals. That's a lot, which leads to my next question is, what does the average day look like, or is there no average day? (laughs) Well, it's quite different now, isn't it, in this this time of uh, uh, working at home and, and many Zoom calls every day. I think this might be my fourth or fifth digital interview or conversation today already. The average day, I think, for me is, is maybe somewhat different um, from some nonprofit leaders because my staff is so small that each of us plays a role in a lot of the basic elements of the organization, as well as um, some of those more strategic planning questions. For example, today I um, have been on a call with my admin intern who is looking at tagging our supporters and tagging all the work that we've written 
so that people can find it when they're looking on our website um, and find themselves. I uh, spoke with our outreach team about a, a summer speaker series that we're doing on a range of topics related to women's representation. I uh, met with our team that's working on a presentation on international women's representation, which I think is very important and interesting. We're putting the final touches on that. And then um, I also need to carve out some time today to do outreach to potential donors uh, with a new report that we have on, on the impact of ranked choice voting for women and people of color. So uh, reaching out to people who I know share an interest in that work, but haven't yet donated, but I'd like them to donate um, so that I can build our staff. So it's really that range of things. Um, even getting back to the international chart, for example, just looking at voting systems used around the world and trying to understand how to really define them and then how that information can be useful to a U.S. audience. That's, I did a lot of that today as well. Wow. You've worked, and it's quite rare, at all tiers of government, federal level, state level, local level. You've had communications with people who are campaigning at those levels, people work at those levels. Have you drawn any general lessons about governance from these experiences? I would say um, it's awfully important to have a goal that you're aspiring to. It's very important to have a big vision um, and to really have a sense of what brings you to this work, what brings me to this work. I think if I didn't wake up every morning with a sense of excitement about engaging with a new audience or uh, doing new research, uh, launching new inquiries into women's representation in certain categories that we hadn't thought about, if I didn't have that sense of passion, I think it would be hard to do the work well. At the same time, I think it's awfully important to listen to the people around you, to be a good um, a moderator, I guess, of what's aspirational, but really what's also practical and strategic. So it could be that we want to get five reports out, and it would be great if we could get them all out by the end of the week, but that's just not possible to do a good job on five different reports. So I think being a good leader is really about having a sense of where you want to go, but also hearing others and engaging others and then evolving. And if a way I've been thinking about something or talking about something, you know, it turns out really isn't the best way to do it. It's, I think, having the humility to recognize when it's time to retool and um, to rethink how, how we're talking about it, how we're approaching things. So I think of it as a really a learning process, but also keeping my eyes on the prize all the time. As a follow-up on lessons learned, when I read your work, when I listen to you speak, I often see the words systems, rules. What are the big takeaways about systems and rules in terms of governance and governance reform? Well, that's a great question, really probably one of my favorite questions. And sadly, I think not one that many um, Americans engage with enough. The big takeaways that, that motivate me are a belief that the the concept of democracy that the founders inherited to a certain extent from William Penn, who had inherited it from the Iroquois Indians in upstate New York, this, this frame of government where everybody has a voice and uh, the people who are governed have a say in how they're governed and who governs them, that's a super important system to me. And even though in some respects, democracy, I would say, is under fire around the world in places like Hungary and in Russia and um, even in the United States, some might say. I think it's awfully important to build the best systems that we can to represent people and to give people power um, and to empower other people to make decisions on behalf of their constituents. And so I see that as very important. And I I also think that um, we have a pretty unique perspective on that as Americans. We think so much about individualism in the United States. And in some ways, I suspect many people, maybe some listeners would even say, well, that's what makes America great. But it also means that we're sometimes outside of the, the lived experience of what data from other countries tells us and what, um, what new rules and systems could be adopted and innovated to make sure that people are better represented and have a better voice in government. And so I guess I see as my um, challenge in this work to advance women's representation and leadership in the United States is to bring a systems thinking lens, a data-driven lens to this work of getting more women in office. My goal really, or, or part of my strategy, is to help people pivot 
exclusively from a um, how to prepare the individual person to run for office, but how to prepare the system so that individuals can run successfully in it. And there are a lot of steps in that process. But I think when we embrace the fact that um, systems really impact outcomes, I think we're all better off. And I'll just mention that um, this weekend was the anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which I like to talk about a lot because it was a, a systems reform that advanced opportunities for people who simply didn't have access to those opportunities before it existed. And I think those system strategies have been used uh, for Title IX, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, even suffrage itself, are all examples of changing rules and systems and not the individuals impacted by those rules and systems. And one of the advantages I see of that is that kind of change, I think, is the most enduring kind of change and is a, is a kind of a change that everybody can get on board with because they see it's just leveling the playing field for whatever group of people are disadvantaged by the current system. This uh, system sort of approach to governance reform, that was what you were doing and continue to do also with your other work, with ranked choice voting, correct? Correct, exactly, yes. And for listeners who are not familiar with ranked choice voting, can you explain why this is a systems change and why it's advantageous? Sure. Well, ranked choice voting is, is a great um, example of a, of a mechanism uh, to ensure that the most voters um, can cast votes for candidates who represent them in an election. And it replaces the winner-take-all voting system, which the United States inherited from the UK and which is used by Canadians and um, French and uh, still a number of countries use it. But the largest type of democracy um, or, the, or the most quickly growing type of democracy with new democracies, new as in in the last uh, 100 years or so, is a system that's based uh, more on the concept of a proportional representation system where votes really translate into seats effectively. And what ranked choice voting does is, is akin to that in that it lets voters say, here's my first choice, here's my second choice, here's my third choice on a ballot. And if somebody wins for an executive race like mayor or in a presidential primary or governor, um, then that candidate wins. But if somebody gets under 50% of the vote, in other words, a plurality, but not a majority of the vote, then the last place finisher is eliminated and their votes are then shared with the remaining candidates. And if there's a majority winner after that process, then they win. But the process continues until a majority winner is selected. The reason I think that reform Um, is important in a foundational way, is I think that it helps the United States meet the aspirations of the founders, which was to ensure that the majority of people really have a say in in who governs us and the outcome of elections. It's important in my particular work on women's representation, because as it turns out, having a, a ranked ballot means that there's more civility in the election. If you and I are both running for a seat, I want your supporters to rank me second on their ballot. So it's a way of building in an incentive for civility, which helps address uh, polarization and these very polarized times we're living in. And it also can cost less uh, because it replaces runoffs, which often cost quite a bit of money to run in. So that's another benefit of it. And then uh, it also, of course, uh, eliminates split votes among like-minded candidates. So that's another reason that women uh, benefit from it. But really, um, in many respects, everybody benefits from it. And it's actually being used now by uh, Democratic and Republican parties for internal elections. And in primaries, the Republican Party just used it in primaries for, in Virginia for Congress um, a couple of weeks ago. And a nice, a great woman, Alicia Andrews, won. But it's also been used in presidential caucuses and, and primaries this year. And it's used in a few dozen uh, jurisdictions in the United States. The state of Maine uses it. Um, and then it's on the ballot or being considered in terms of legislation in, I think, I don't know, a few dozen states have some legislation pending um, in the state legislature. So it's an exciting time for systems thinking in that regard. Improving the system, improving the incentives, improving the results. That makes a lot of sense. Going back to your leadership position at Represent Women, what's the toughest part of your current job? To be honest, it's having such a small staff. I mean, I feel like we have so many, I think, great ideas, and I don't see other people working on them. And I wish we had the resources 
to be um, researching things, more areas of representation, better, you know, best practices that exist in different circumstances, and then really could be doing a better job packaging that data, helping to visualize that data, and then sharing it with a wider audience. Uh, it's, it's awfully tough. We're just, we have a three-person staff, but I think the interest in our work is growing. We had, oh, I don't know, 160 or so intern applications this, for this summer. So there's a lot of interest in our work, but we, we need more staff to get it done. That's the bottom line. So for my closing question, I always ask my guests, why public service? You could have chosen another career path, but you've taken your life and devoted it to the hard work of improving governance. Why? I think part of it is that I'm a Quaker. My family's been Quaker for the last 400 years or so. Um, so I believe deeply in, in that value of adding to society, that that's our purpose is to make the world a better place. I guess that's just been so much part of, of my upbringing and what my family has done and pretty much all of the people before me have contributed in some way or another. So in that sense, it comes very naturally. I also uh, had a father who was a philosopher. He taught at Colgate University, and he really thought all the time about our ethical obligation to other people and that idea of a, a social and political contract among citizens in a society and what it means to be a, an ethically contributing member of a society. I, I, I talked a lot about the categorical imperative when I was growing up, Kant's categorical imperative, probably more than most eight-year-old girls, I would say. Actually, you know, to be honest, it never occurred to me to do anything other than, than public service in some way. I, maybe, it's, maybe it's a little grandiose of me, but I feel like we need more people who bring a passion and a love of country and a love of people all together and, and really help people out. I feel like I certainly uh, get a lot of value from that. And maybe it's a privileged thing to be able to spend the time doing this work. I readily admit that, but I'm certainly driven by my Quaker ancestors and my parents and uh, the people around me who are all, I guess, in the sector. I certainly fit into my bubble. Someone has to do the work. And my hope with this podcast is that more listeners will decide to choose public service. Cynthia, thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to Why Public Service, a podcast of the R Street Institute. Please subscribe to the podcast and share it with your friends. Even better, rate and review us on iTunes so we can reach more listeners. Tell us what you thought about it and who we should interview next by finding us on Twitter at RSI. If you want to know more about R Street, Sign up for our newsletters at www.rstreet.org. I'm your host, Kevin Kosar. Thank you to producer William Gray and editor Parker Tant from parkerpodcasting.com.